Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I've got Bob Etherington on the, uh, on the, on the show. We're going to be talking about how to get started in sales, so what it takes to get started in a successful sales career. Uh, by, by way of introduction, um, Bob has had a, a career in sales since the 1970s and today leads strategic sales programs. He's the author of several best-selling books on selling, and he was recently the guest of honor and keynote speaker at the annual UK conference, the Society of Sales Innovation. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be here. So tell me, what inspired you to write the book, Selling Skills for Complete Amateurs? When I I first went into selling, I found it very, very difficult. I joined Xerox, I'm going, as you say, right back to the 1970s. Um, And uh, they they showed no mercy. You were given the training, you were told that if you carry out uh, your selling in the way that we tell you, you will succeed, but you've got to do what we tell you. Your job was on the line every week, but the money was good, so you just stuck with it, and they kept their promise to you. But what inspired me to write um, a book called you know, Selling for Complete Amateurs was that I was originally going to call it Selling for Senior Management, but I don't know whether people would have taken that as old age pensioners. So I thought that, um, <laughs> well, you, you, it, it's, it's okay here, because we call old age pensioners old, old age pensioners, but in, here in London. But in in the States, you've got seniors. And I didn't want it to appear to be that. Because some of the biggest problems I've had in selling have been when the managing director or my senior boss wanted to come out with me to visit a client. And they would almost invariably put their foot in it because they actually didn't know how to sell. Mm -hmm. And they started giving away the shop and offering discounts that we didn't have to offer. So I wanted to write a book that would be read and aimed at the top management in most companies. But I couldn't, couldn't find an ideal title. So I went to the other end where I started out and called it um, Selling for Complete Amateurs. And it's getting quite a good readership now. It's all the basic stuff. I mean, there's an awful lot of complex sales terminology and sales systems now. But most people, as far as I can see, and I spend at least one day a week out with um, salespeople in the field, most people are still stuck in the old ways of selling. So I want to try and get them to understand what it takes to sell right now in this increasingly difficult marketplace. Okay, well, you're referring to the old ways of selling and then today's marketplace. What do you consider to be the old ways of selling and what do you consider to be today's ways of selling? Well, when I started out, and it was with Xerox, Xerox had a unique product worldwide and that was plain paper copiers. Nobody else, although not many people like me can remember those days, most other copiers, all other copiers had to have a photosensitive paper. Xerox had a plain paper copy, it was their USP, and they wanted people to go out and bang on doors and close just about everybody they they met. Um, Right back then, there there wasn't any competitor. And so the way to sell the product was to show it off. Everybody had to learn one of three demonstrations for the small copy of the middle one and and, and the big one. And that was the right way to do it, to showcase it. Move on now 30, 40 years, and everything has changed with the internet and the, the, the change marketplace all, all around. There are now thousands of copiers out there, thousands of just about any product. There's no shortage in any market, product or service. Mm-hmm. So if you go and try and pitch your product and demonstrate it to everybody, all the products, because of the internet in any particular market, tend to look the same. And people get fed up with, oh, no, here comes another presentation. Today, and that was in the days what I call people were asked to communicate the value of their product. Today, you've got to create value. And the value creation happens inside the client's head. So your sales effort more is far less on telling than on asking. So you, before you go and see a customer, you've got to sit down and say, what, what problems is in my product or my service designed to, to fix? You've got to know for any customer, um, th- then their particular needs are going to be different. So not everybody wants everything. But by asking a few questions at the beginning and you know, cover it with the person you've gone to see, 
and say, look, I'm going to rather pitch at you like most people when I'm going to ask you some questions, uh, get the client's agreement, and then you start a dialogue going from which you can very quickly glean what, this, what sort of headaches this guy is having and whether or not you can help him or not. That makes a ton of sense. What, what would you say your, your best tips for getting started in sales are? Go to a company which has got a very good training system. Not just, I mean, classroom training, which is what I do an awful lot of, is very good for getting the basic idea of new concepts across to people. It is absolutely hopeless for embedding those skills and turning them into habits. The only way you can do that properly is to have a field coaching uh, session with each salesperson. In fact, a lot of what most sales managers around the world should be doing is, co is constantly coaching in the field the people that have to report to them. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen. Everybody pays lip service to it, and they realize you've got to try and do it. And just about every other profession you can think of, you know, medicine or dentistry or the legal profession, in order to keep your license, and definitely true here in London, I'm sure it is in America, you have to go on regular um, performance reviews and, re and, and revisions of what you've done before. Otherwise, you don't keep your qualification. That applies to just about every profession apart from selling. So people very quickly go back to their old habits. And people sell as they used to, and they're still trying to sell by pitching in the main because that's what used to work. And you're finding now that more and more companies are sacking salespeople, getting rid of them, because they, can't, they haven't moved on mentally to where they've got to be for selling for the next 10 years, which I can tell you is going to be a lot tougher than it has been for the last 20. And what are the main drivers that you see for the sales career getting, getting uh, tougher? The c customers on, uh, first of all, there is an absolutely no truth in, in, in the statement that um, people stop buying stuff in a recession. It isn't true at all. People will still buy things, but they want two things in difficult, tough times. As I say, which are times that we're going into. One is confidence, and the other is they want to feel safe. So you've got to make sure your message contains whatever you're selling, your, your message is focused on those things because that's what everybody's looking for. And people are not. What they try and do, they go into somewhere and spray everything that they can do all over the customer. And I hope the customer will say, well, I like that and I like that and I like this, but nothing else. It's not what happens. People get confused. Your job is, or my job when I'm out selling, I've got to know what I can do, the sort of, customer, the sort of prospects that make good customers for me, ask them some questions to focus on things that I know I can fix and then leave it to me to get the customer to focus on the problems and the consequences of not fixing that problem. What I call consequence questions are easily the most powerful and persuasive questions you can ask. And most people don't do that. Still, still today, despite all the training that's gone on in the last 30 or 40 years, people still try and sell by uh, talking. Talking brochure is the least popular mode of selling if you ask any buyer. <laughs> yeah, it's what most people still do. I love that talking brochure methodology. The, the talking brochure sales methodology. That's Don't what do most that. people do. <laughs> at the moment, if you go around the world, you'll see that most businesses are looking at the way the world's going from China to Trump to Europe and Brexit and Italy and Greece. And they're saying, well, what on earth are we going to do to sell into these difficult markets? The first thing they think of, it's all about money. And so they try and start discounting. And yet there's no evidence that cutting your prices brings you any more business, none at all. Then they say, well, soon the good times will be back again. This isn't going to happen this time. This is the new normal we're going through now. Get used to it. Third thing sales managers do is they say to salespeople, go out, knock on more doors, see more people. It's a numbers game. It absolutely isn't. If you want to demoralize a sales force, that's what you do. And, and, and finally, they start fiddling with the advertising budget. If they already do sort of magazine and media advertising, they start uh, um, cutting their costs and then they do fewer adver adverts. Their customer base thinks they've gone away. Or they go to the other extreme and say, we'll try and advertise our way out of this. And they start um, um, sell it, spending a lot more, which only generates an awful lot of inquiries from people who are never going to be prospects anyway. The, the, the thing we have to get across to Salesforce now and teach them to do is number one, create value and stop trying to communicate it. That means a lot of preparation before you're going to see a client. It means knowing not what your, your product does, but what it means, what those outcomes can mean to saving um, a, 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 
your, your customer an awful lot of time and trouble in the upcoming marketplace. People just aren't doing that. Right? Yeah, not, not, they're not speaking to value. They're not, they're not, they're not, le they're not mm -hmm. communicating. Here's, here's what, uh, here's what we do. Here's the value that it brings to you. They're, you cannot describe value. You can't do that. Your customer's sitting there saying, and I always imagine my customer sitting there saying to me, he won't ever articulate this. He'll say, show me something I didn't already know about a problem I didn't realize I had, and then show me the solution I hadn't anticipated. That, that most buyers will tell you they've had one or two of those experiences in their life, and that's proper selling. That's the new mm -hmm. salesman's job. Yeah. Um, uh, whenever you're I, going to see a customer, you should be thinking to yourself, look, is this next meeting with this customer going to be so valuable to him that he will think I should really pay that salesman for his time today? Is it great, that insightful? Great way to look at it. Insight? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a fantastic way to look at it. It really is. And one thing that you wrote in your book that I just loved, um, never make a statement when you can ask a question. Could you, could you explain to our listeners what this means to you and why it's so important? Absolutely. And this was something I was actually trained to do at, at Xerox, good old Xerox. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. It was an excellent training, very tough. What it means is that questions, this all came out of uh, some research done in the 1980s. I think it was Xerox themselves who wanted to know what it was their best salespeople did that made them so good at selling. Was it closing power? Was it um, objection handling? And they discovered it was none of those things. It was simply that the top salespeople asked more questions. Then you've got to say, why does that work? Two things. One is the most obvious one. And that is it gives you an understanding of what this customer, the one you're sitting opposite now, might be in the market to, to buy because he's got a problem that it could fix. That's the, the, you say, well, it's easy. I understand that. But the second and more powerful thing it does is much more interesting. When somebody asks you a question, if I say to you, where did you get that blue jacket I can see you wearing on? Where did you get it? This, this one? I have yeah. no idea. Uh, I think Banana Republic or something. But what did you have to do when I asked you a question? You see, when I was yapping at you just before that, you could let your mind wander and everything else like customers do. Mm -hmm. As soon as I ask you a question, it's like getting a hold of you by the lapels and jerking you towards me. You cannot simultaneously think of anything else. Yeah. But before you go in to see a customer, you think what questions are going to ask him about, about problems I know I can fix. And then once he's revealed those, let's say I've got 10 things I could do and he only wants two of them, that's fine. I'll then ask him about the, the two things that he said he has got a bit of a problem with. Now I've got to anticipate, he might say to me, yeah, Bob, but it's really, I mean, I, I agree with what you say, but it's not worth the cost or hassle of taking any time to fix it. I've got to think to myself, if he says that to me in this meeting I'm about to go to, why would he be wrong? What question am I going to ask him to make him think, oh, that seemed like a little problem, but from what he said now, I can see that it could grow to a big one. So all the while, a good salesman is working on the, on the prospect's imagination. And the imagination does the selling, and the selling and the value creation happens in his head. So what would you say the top questions are, that, or the top types of questions that salespeople should ask their prospects? Well, first of all, if somebody rings me and I run a training company and they say, we've just looked, uh, we've just seen you on the website, Bob, or we've, uh, we've listened to you on the podcast the other day, and we think we could do with a training boost here. Can you tell me how much it will cost? I say, well, fine. Of course, I can tell you how much it will cost. But first of all, can you tell me this? And this is my top question. It's a showstopper a lot of the time. What problem are you trying to fix? Well, what, you, know, you don't have somebody in. I mean, I'm a nice chap. But you're not going to ship me over into the States and for me just to say nice things. So you, you want me to fix a problem. It's something we can measure um, at the end of a training course. What do you want to do? So... You've always got to start with not just, you've got to prepare for your questions, which people don't do. And this, so what they tend to do is they've been on a course with me. I've got to ask some questions. They start to ask banal questions. You've got to know the answer to some of these, but not everyone. They might say, what, what sort of a business are you? How many employees do you have? How many sales force is that? How are sales going? People feel interrogated after a few of those. As quickly mm -hmm. as possible, you want to identify the tip of the iceberg where you might be able to help. So knowing what you know about your product and what it can do, you then ask a, a few questions about that and you define the tip of the iceberg. And most people at this stage would then say, let me show you what we can do. It's too early for that. 
you've got to go to the consequence phase. So if we let that thing roll on, which you admitted was a problem, what's going to happen now? So you have quite a few consequence questions and you encourage the customer to do most of the talking. And that is what, as I say, that's what does the selling. And you don't get anything nice and happy out like the solution. Maybe not at that first meeting, maybe the second or third meeting. You still want to do what the customer wants to do, and that's discuss his problem. Not your problem, not your issues, but his problem. I've got mm -hmm. one customer who's recently sold a business, and he's very wealthy. And all I ever had to do with him, he'd invite me out to lunch once a year, and he'd say, come and have lunch, Bob. He'd take me to a very expensive restaurant in Kensington in the West End of London. And for the whole of lunchtime, he would sit there telling me about his problems. And all I had to do was say, goodness me, Nigel, that sounds like a problem. I don't believe it. Did this happen and then that happened? Oh, that sounds dreadful. And he would fill in the gaps for me. And at the end of two hours, he'd say, that was really good talking to you, Bob. <laughs> but that's, what, that's, the art of, that's the art of selling. He talked himself into the, in, in, into, the, into the sale. And that's your job as a salesperson. I'm not to be a big hard closer, but to get to people to a stage at which they conclude that maybe you were right after all. Makes a ton of sense to me. And I think it's so important to uncover as early in the sales cycle as possible what the person's problem is that they're talking to you in the first place. Because everyone's busy today. People don't come to you just to chit chat, they they have a problem that, and there, or something that they that they're they want to be engaging with you that because they think that you can solve it. That's why they're talking to a salesperson in the first place. It's not because you're cute. No. <laughs> well, at least even, it's not, well, even, not even better not today, <laughs> even better, they're looking for, to you and me for, or at least to me because that's my job for insight. Mm -hmm. They don't just want to necessarily come to you um, because they have a problem. Maybe they haven't got a problem. They want you to point out something that they hadn't seen. Mm -hmm. That's the value. Yeah. Something, you've got to know your market that well. And again, this is what Xerox taught me to do years ago. The questioning, although they used to call it probing, wasn't as big now, uh, then, but now it is the big thing that we have to get people doing, asking more questions. Mm -hmm. And once, say, once, think it, so if I ask my wife, for example, have you, have, my, have you got a tissue? She doesn't give me a tissue. She says, what have you spilt? <laughs> <laughs> And that's the art of selling. As a customer says something to you, you've got to say, think to yourself, why did he just tell me that? Before I ask me that question, before I open my big mouth, I better try and find out what's going on in his life that he had to ask me that question. Yeah. So the answer to, can I have it in red, isn't, yes, you can. It's, that's an unusual request. Could you tell me why? Because that might be the big thing on which it's going to hinge. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, generally, women do it better than men. That's all I was going to say uncovering uh, what the problems really are and and having that empathy to put yourself in your customer's shoes is such an important skill in sales i believe it, it's because uh, if you understand their problem and you can truly empathize with them and you want it, then you can map the rest of your conversation and, on, and map your questions map the value that you are presenting to that customer and a lot of products are complicated today right like yeah. you know they have six value propositions and you have to know which one's really going to resonate with the customer. You don't want to just yeah. start spitting them out. You want to find out which one's going to resonate and then present the correct one. That's right. And also, I mean, that's a simple selling. Then you get into more complex accounts, you know, the large multinational, the guy who's asked you to come in, in my case, if it's training, it'll often be the HR manager or the training department. But I always try and do once I'm in, is get as high up inside the company with the help of my contact as I can, where the big decisions for big contracts are being made. Mm -hmm. And I, I always try, as Steve Martin said, you know, how did you get so good in comedy? He was so good, they couldn't ignore him. So you make yourself so useful to the person who's your initial contact, and you make them look good in the eyes of their boss, that you are able to operate at much higher level. Yeah. I ask tell everybody, even you know, doing what you do, what I do, it's a very important skill not to just remain in that little enclave in the corner of the, the corporate world. Nobody knows you're there. It's to do your best. And I've done it on quite a few occasions. I mean, with a, one of the big Scandinavian oil companies, we ran a negotiating program for them. And every, before every program, the big boss would come down and basically put his rubber stamp on it and say, this is an important course. We were running a leadership program for one of the gas companies here in the UK until a couple of years ago. The big boss did exactly the same then and told everybody how important it was. If you can get that, if you can get engagement at the top, then uh, you're doing very well. But you've got to work hard for it. You can't just uh, stay there uh, preening yourself. 
you've got to be good every week for them. So on the flip side, what would you say the unintentional sales killers are? How do you, and, and, and furthermore, how can people that are new to sales avoid them? You've got to really encourage your boss to come out with you and then sit tight while you make a mess of it. I mean, 30, 40 years ago, I learned to fly. And the only way you can learn to fly a little airplane is to make mistakes. So your instructor takes you up high enough, will stall the plane or get into a spin. And while you're falling out of the sky, he'll say, now correct it for me. And you've got enough time to make mistakes. Unless you make mistakes, you're not going to get out there. So really, got, I've got, one of the things you've got to try and do is stop sales managers when they see a salesman come back into the office after you've seen a client, you say, did you close it? Because the answer is usually no, and nobody wants to tell them that. And sales managers need to be much more encouraging of people's mistakes. What you really want to see them do is get out and see more customers and ask the right sort of questions. But generally, pitching, as I said to you, talking brochure is the biggest problem that we've had and we still have in the sales force, sales forces of the world. And the, the, the other thing which is really saddening is when the customers come in and had the initial sales pitch. Okay, he said he's talked too much during the, uh, during the first interview. But the customer leaves with the words, thank you very much, that was great, we'll let you know soon. That is simply the client saying, I'm not really interested, um, you're never going to hear from me again. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Always wonder how many, if you look in your own sales funnel, how many orders have you got pending in that, in that, in that block, which I will let you know soon from people you're probably never going to hear from again. Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the most common conclusions of a sales call. And I, I won't let it end there. One, one strategy that I've used in the past is when, when you kind of get that, 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 oh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll talk soon. We'll talk later. Like, great. Yeah, I'll let you know. I'll, I'll try, I, I'll turn that around and say, you know, when, when someone tells me that, it either means that uh, that they're just not interested in, in in what I've what we've talked about and what my product or service is, or it means that they're interested but they're not sure. Which which is it here? And either direction, it's good for you. If it's truly they're not interested because this is just not what they do, or it's not a good fit for them, or whatever, they'll tell you right then, and you can take them off your list and and yep. not, not keep wasting time. But if they're not sure, they'll be like, well, and you, I'm, I'm, I'm just not sure because I'm, I'm a little concerned about X, Y, Z. And then you can start a direct, you can keep the conversation going at that time rather than just letting it die, right. which, I, and, and that can, that can keep the ball moving. Yes. Well, I often say to people in that situation, do you want it or not? Um, well, I don't, don't really know. I always say, well, do you mean you really don't want it or, is it that you want it, but you don't know whether it'll fit? So you've got the three questions. Is there a good fit? Is it the functionality or is it the price? Mm -hmm. One of those three things it will be. And I try and get people to, to, to level with me because I don't want to be in a permanent limbo of not knowing. Yeah, and really all objections come down to one of those things. I, I call those the three Fs, uh, fit, functionality, and uh, I forget what, what I, I had. It, finance, yeah, I, I knew I had an F for price. <laughs> I, that's absolutely right, and, and I still encourage a lot. I mean, hanging around social media all day long, like a lot of people seem to. I use social media, but not 100%. I teach, try and teach people to make a cold call, a business-to-business -business cold call. And to try and avoid the trap of classic cold calls, which I get about once or twice a day. And a ring, 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 ring. Oh, good morning. Is that Mr. Then they struggle with my name, Efric Tom. I say yes. Uh, How are you today, sir? And they've got this false bonhomie. I immediately know that's a salesperson trying to make a cold call. And all I'm thinking from that point, like Pavlov's dogs, is how do I get rid of him? Right, right, exactly. How much better rather than try and get the appointment or the order across the phone straight away, why not do what is essential at this stage, try and establish trust and honesty? Why don't you say something like, oh, good morning, Mr. Prospect. I'm sorry to call you on a Wednesday morning. I wonder if you can help me. I don't know. It depends what it is. Um, I represent a company which does this, solves this sort of problem, and I'm trying to meet uh, the person in your company who has to struggle, wrestle, whatever it is, some emotive word with the problem. Would that be you? Well, maybe. Then you say, well, would you be open to hearing about ways that we have of solving that problem? If he says no, they say, that's absolutely fine. Put the phone down. Mm -hmm. If he says, well, I might be, then we try and have a conversation, a chat about it. 
but not a pitch. So you try and change the whole atmosphere at the beginning of the call. Yeah, yeah. I've just, I, I, I'm hot on this one because I've just been writing an entry on LinkedIn about that very thing. So I just put it in before I came up to talk to you. Uh, I think that's a great strategy. Mm. In Another thing I wanted to talk to you about was in your book, you have a, a chapter titled How to Sell in the Worst of Times. Um, can you give, uh, can, you, can you explain kind of how to sell in the worst of times? What techniques do you use? How do, how do they work? Number one, you've got to keep very close to your existing clients. As you know, being a businessman, it's 80% easier to get more business from an existing happy client than go out and find one new one. Mm -hmm. Most people teach the, treat the last sale that they made as a business equivalent of a one night stand. But to really, really, really look after your customers. And you know, even if it costs you every penny of your commission, every cent of your commission, make sure you keep your promises. Don't let people down. You know, if you say, I'm going to call you back by the end of the day, call them back. And if you say, well, he might be angry, that's your job of handling him when he's angry. So you look after your existing customer base, you make sure you stay in touch with them somehow so that they'll regularly, you know, when their existing supplier lets them down, you're there. You're the number one person at the top of the list. And secondly, you, you do, do what I said to, to do earlier on. You think this customer, like all customers now, wants safety and confidence. They will, they are prepared to pay for it. I mean, years ago when IBM were being challenged by the first PC makers, they came up with a, with a strategy, uh, a, a strap line, I mean, which was nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. No, because it was reliable, people were prepared to pay a bit more. Make sure that you're worth paying more to. And say to people, and I do all the time, if, you, if we're not happy with what we deliver, you can have your money back because I don't want you walking around the market saying that Bob Etherington was useless. If you've got a problem with me, I don't want you to pay me. And I never had to give the money back. I would, but I haven't had to. I'm quite prepared. Have that much confidence in what it is that you do and not make people have to stay with you because they've signed a contract. So these are the basic things. You've got to prepare for calls. You've got to treat your existing customers with kid gloves so that you don't let another, it shouldn't be a surprise, to, you know, it should always be a surprise if somebody gets in through the back door. It must be something you're doing incorrectly. Um, but it's, again, it's controlling the whole sales process. Uh, as you'll be several meetings in what you do, make sure that before you go in to see a customer for any one meeting, you think, what is the minimum next step I want from him before I leave the office today? Is it to meet with him and his finance director or meet with him and some of the staff will have to use it? And you might make a big leap in that meeting, but make sure you've got that as a target. And all the while, your customer's agreeing to take that next step. Um, the date and time you, you agree with him, you still have control. As soon as they start saying, we'll let you know soon, you've lost control. So these are the, they're the fundamentals. Everybody's looking for the intergalactic sales model, but these fundamentals are what you've really got to master. Yeah, that, that all really resonates with me. And, and, and I would say even in the best of times, I, I try to be a maniac about staying close to existing customers. Yep. Last, uh, a good example of this, last spring, I took a seven-week uh, and, and I don't know how, how much you know about my background, but I, I'm CEO of Badger Maps and um, a software company. It, we, we, uh, so we have a bunch of customers. And I went and visited 100 of our 300 largest customers in over the course of a seven-week road trip. So I, I literally drove around the country just meeting with CEOs of companies that were customers of ours, VPs of sales, directors of sales operations, whoever kind of was were the key people involved um, with using our product and, you know, we're kind of, whoever was our key point of contact, contact for, for, for this. And, uh, you know, just to get to know them better, to talk about where we're going, get feedback from them about what they've experienced, what they, what they like, what they don't like, anything. And, uh, and I, I found it to be one of the most valuable things I'd ever done for them. Yeah because I was able to really, it, it really helped it to this day. It's still guiding the, you know, as I, it, you know, guides the direction the engineering team's taking guides guide when I, it's always, I, I've got, it, it helps me put faces to names and I, and I, you know, and, and faces to problems that have been described to me, yep. whether, it's, whether it's our, you know, sales team or customer service team or engineering team, it helps, helps me guide those teams. Cause I've got, 
you know, the customer kind of top of mind. And I, and I think leader, whether, whether you're in a leadership role at a company or, or you're a salesperson at a company, who, whatever it is, being very close to your existing customers is so important. There, there's maybe right. nothing more important. Well, I say you'll let somebody like me in if you're not. You know, even if somebody says to me, oh, we already use Hathaway Training or one of the other big, I stay close because sooner or later, the big company is going to mess up or something they can't do and I'll be in there. Whatever yeah. customers say to you, keep in contact with them. Have some sort of keep in touch campaign. I don't mind what it is. Mm-hmm. The guy who's, who's, who's always said to be the best, all-time best salesman in North America was a fellow called Joe Girard, who you may have heard of. He used I to, have, yeah. And he was down. And all he used to do to do to do this, he used to send a group of, of uh, cler- clerical staff who used to send postcards out every month to their existing and past clients. And across the front of it was written, we like you. And that was it. That was it. Every month. We tried a similar sort of thing o- over here to that, and it works every time. Every month they get something branded, which is yours. We, we sent a little cartoon out. And then they say, you can actually... G- get cartoons from cartoonbank.com in the States. And there are a lot of cartoons out of New Yorker magazine and you can use them as you want to. Just something humorous with your branding, your color on it. That if somebody gets every month, they pin it on the wall, pin it on the wall, and an existing supplier, in your case, Maps, uh, lets them down. They say, oh, these guys send us something. Give them a ring. Yes. Yeah. Just basic branding. Mm-hmm. And you, know, you try and uh, make this all seem very complicated not you personally a lot of these things it's very simple all you've got to do is do it and luckily not many people do so that you know, makes life good for me and probably for you too yeah well the next the next section of the show here is uh what i call sales in 60 seconds so i'll ask you a series of questions with the goal of, of answering the question briefly in in 60 seconds okay go on then. all right you ready yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So first question, what is a common mistake sales reps make when they start their career? Uh, talking too much, uh, going around to see customers without a plan and uh, losing their way in the darkness and not coming up with anything. And uh, what's one thing outside salespeople should know about the modern buyer? The modern buyer, he wants to be amazed. He wants insight. As I said to you before, that you've always got to imagine a customer saying to you, show me something I didn't already know about a problem I didn't realize I had, and then show me the solution I hadn't anticipated. Always be thinking along those lines. And of course, you know, get the customer thinking, or get you thinking before you go see the customer, I've uh, got to make this next call so valuable that he will feel like um, he, that he will feel he should really be paying me for this. If you had to name one critical skill or trait that a salesperson needs today, what skill would it be and why? Listening. You have two, eye, two mouth, ears and one mouth. And I got that really because I, one of my richest client I ever had when I lived in New York City in the 90s was a Chinese guy. And on his desk, you know, a lot of American executives had that like Toblerone bar with their name on the front. But on the back of it, he had one of those. On the back of it, he'd stuck a bit of masking tape on which he'd written the words, maybe he's right. So when anybody came into the office and started telling him stuff, rather than him saying, I'm the boss, this is where it goes, say, maybe this guy's right. Maybe I'd have to listen to him. I like that. What I get when I'm running classes now, I get guys, the delegates, to write across the front of the book, in case they're a bit you know, skeptical about whether I can change anything, write across the front of the book in letters an inch high, maybe he's right. Give me a chance. Give me the benefit of the doubt. Give me till lunchtime, and then you tell me whether you think it's wrong. That's great advice. <laughs> How do you recommend that salespeople differentiate themselves from their competitors? First of all, look at your, all the things, all the outcomes or the solutions or the benefits that you can provide. Compare it with your competitors and pick out the things that make you unique and ask particular questions in those fields when you go and see a customer. What most, again, most of your competitors will be doing what I've criticized people are doing, which is talking at the customer. You've gone and asked some questions particularly about the problems in which areas in which you have a USP, you focus on those and you focus on the consequences of those and it has the effect of shutting out all the people that have been doing the bland, samey sort of things where because of the internet, everybody looks the same. Most people, your competitors especially, are still making those mistakes. I try and get you to stop doing it so that 
a sale is more of a natural process than a dialogue. What is your favorite sales tool? My ears. <laughs> I like it. Well, they'll tell um, you what they want, you know, and you, the words they use are what you should go in your proposal, not you trying to be clever. You're not trying to win an argument with a client. You're trying to get a sale. Let him be right sometimes. Let him be right. There's one electronics uh, place like Radio Shack over in the UK called uh, Maplins. They, the, 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 the branch I used to go to had what, a sign over the entrance which said, rule number one in this store is the customer's always right. Rule number two, when the customer's wrong, see rule number one. <laughs> let him be right let him be right because their money is so green we must always be nice and never mean it's absolutely <laughs> true and yet most people don't do it they say they pay lip service to it but they don't do the basics and that's all you've got to do yeah uh, i think it's a great philosophy as a final takeaway what should the field sales people listening today do as a first step to getting started in sales well, you could get thrown out of your job. I, when I got into sales, because I was an engineer before that, working on the very first ATM machine, and I designed it incorrectly a bit of it, and, uh, um, well, I had to leave that, that very day. But that night I got home, reading the newspaper, and there was an ad in there which said the next 30 seconds could change your life. And it was Xerox. They were offering me a sales training course. There are lots of other companies that are still offering sales training. Go to a company with good basic training, um, and then get out and see, start seeing customers, get somebody to mentor you and guide you through and, uh, and just start enjoying yourself. I mean, our whole motto is, you know, go ahead, enjoy selling. That's what you should be doing. It shouldn't be a hardship. Such, a, real, such a rewarding career, you know. It, it's one of the best directions people can go, I think. Especially people, young people starting out in their careers. I think selling is one of the best skills, crafts that you can develop. Well, if you think about it, every, whether it's your dentist, whether it's an architect, whether it's a cleaning company, they all have this one universal requirement. You've got to find a way of generating new business. It's mm -hmm. called sales. Yeah. And a lot of times, especially here in London, not so much in the, in, a, in, in the States, but people don't want it called selling. I was asked to do a talk in the center of London last week about selling, but I was asked not to mention the word selling. I had to call it business development or uh, informed consent. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. A, a lot of people, well, people used to be called businessmen and you know, that was, it's like, Oh, what do you do? Oh, I do business. That really meant sales. I mean, the, the business that you do that didn't, that didn't mean I worked in a factory or I didn't mean, it didn't mean that I, you know, did the accounting necessarily. It usually meant that you were customer facing and, you know, either servicing the customers to keep them paying or keep the relationship or, or uh, finding the customers in the first place. It was all right. kind of, that, uh, that's often under the, under, the, uh, under the category of sales. Yes, yeah, but a lot of people just don't want to do it. And yet, but, well, they're being slowly kicked out of their jobs now and they're getting more in more people who can take a more considered approach. The job is becoming very, very different and the money out available for a good salesperson is, 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 is growing. So yeah. I recommend you get in Prove to everybody that you're good. Don't keep coming into the office. I remember early criticisms of me when I went for, when I joined Reuters in the late 70s. When I came in with a Xerox mentality, I was never in the office, but I was producing business. And I got told off for not being around. I said, but there are no customers in the office. Why would I <laughs> hang around here all day with a bunch of people hanging around the water coolers telling me what's not going to happen? Right. Um, my, my original boss at Xerox, a fellow called Bruce Cantle, he, I don't know if he's alive or dead now, when I went in for my second sales interview to, to be part of his sales uh, gr group, he took me around the office. He said, what's that over there? And I said, it's a water cooler, Bruce. I said, what's that over there? I said, I don't know. It looks like a kitchen, Bruce. What's that over there? It looks like a coffee machine. And he said, none of those are the, what you described them as. They're all machines for sucking the happiness out of a room. Because when a group of sellers get near them, they all start being miserable. So stay away from the water cooler, the coffee machine, the kitchen and everything else, because they're miserable places. The customers with all the money are out there. So get out of the office. You're not to be in the office between 10 and 4 every day because there's no customers there for you to see. They're all outside. If you want to do phoning, do it from outside. Don't come into the nice warm office you know, where everything's nice and cool because you're not going to do anything. and You're going to be sucked into this big vortex 
of unhappy people. That's great so that's advice. What I did. That's what I did. I just stayed out, produced business. At one stage, I was asked in one company I worked for to slow down because I was making other people look bad. All I was doing was just bringing in business. And I kept it up and they couldn't sack me for doing more than I was supposed to. So I got promoted and I recommend that passage to anyone that's listening to this. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to attempt to summarize the wisdom that you've, uh, that you've provided our listeners here in, uh, in a quick summary. A lot of people are driving, so it's, it's helpful to, uh, to hear it twice. Um, so Bob was inspired to write the book, Selling for Complete Amateurs, to help new people as well as upper management understand the basics of sales. To get started in sales, make sure you start in a company with a great training system. Join a company that focuses on good in-field training so that you have a chance to fail and learn from those failures. Selling is getting increasingly competitive. Make sure you set up yourself to truly succeed by building a good base of selling skills. Build out your craft. In a recession, people keep buying. You just need to keep providing value. Do that by uh, present, present questions that make your prospects face their problems and present the value of your product and the solutions and value that it creates. Don't be a talking brochure. Focus on creating value instead of just kind of regurgitating what they could have read in a brochure. Yep. Whenever you meet with a prospect, think about if you'll bring them enough value for them to want to move forward and make a purchase. Remember to ask questions. Asking your prospects questions first gives, it gives them an understanding of what you're providing from them because you can, you can guide them. Uh, you, guide, you guide your answers based on what they've said, what they, what the, how they answer your questions. Um, as soon as you ask a question, you get people thinking about something and it, it holds their attention better. You can, you can think about which questions you can ask to think about their problems and, and help them realize if, if they need to solve these problems. Maybe they didn't even know about the problem in the first place, but you, by asking questions, you get them in their own words to articulate it. Remember to prepare your questions in advance and also anticipate their reactions and responses and objections that will flow from these questions. Encourage your prospect to do most of the talking and focus on their problems and how to create, how you can create value around them. The art of selling is to get your prospect to talk themselves into the sale. They need to realize that they will actually get value from your solution. And often that comes from them talking, not you talking, which is a little counterintuitive, but it is a key point here. Um, the most important skill to have in sales is to listen. Show that you care about your prospect's problems. Encourage your prospect to think maybe he's right. And that's a, that's a great strategy that you can use in your life as well when, uh, when you're interacting with people is keep an open mind, think in the back of your mind, maybe he's right or she's right. Bob, this has been some just fantastic advice today. Tell me, where can our listeners read more about your work? How do they reach out to you? Well, they can write one of the the book you mentioned today is only one of four books. First one was Cold Calling for Chickens. The second one was Presentation Skills for Quivering Wrecks. The third one was um, uh, Negotiating Skills for Virgins. And the last one was the one you've been mentioned. all of them are selling very well. So you can buy those books and read up. But if you're inspired from those, you can always have me come in. And I used to live in New York City, so I know America very well. And in most other cities in the world, too. I've sold in most of them. Um, I can come in and listen to what you have to say and the sort of problems you're trying to fix and actually run some programs for you to build your sales force up to the level you'd like them to be. And it's really a choice that you have to make. Most companies, most sales forces are operating at much too low a level. Um, so you can get hold of me via my website, um, 
which is bob at bobetherington.com. Or you can ring me from the States and I'll take a call from you. You can get right through to me on 011-44-207-486-4878. But uh, if you want, as you say, if you go to my website, www.bobetheringtongroup.com, you can find out a lot about what I do. If you want to chat to me on the phone for a little while and find out whether we can have something which is mutually binding for both our companies, then it'll be really great. I thoroughly enjoy selling. I've been doing it for years and uh, looks as though I'll carry on doing it until um, I'm no longer able to get in the car and drive down the road. <laughs> well, fantastic. And we'll put all that, th- those links in the, uh, in, the, in the show notes so that people can have access to them. Um, this has been a great episode uh, for Outside Sales Talk here. Uh, if you can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from, from learning the topics that Bob was able to cover today, please uh, share the episode with them and uh, you know, send, send it on to them so they can get that benefit too. Take care. Until next time, guys.